is not my desire to speak long, but I have a nugget of truth, the Lord helping, that I want to share with you from Acts 11, also from Mark, from Mark 7, by God's wonderful grace, we tried to obey the Lord and go into the chapters where he's witnessed. And uh, so I said to Stephen, Stephen, I don't know what it, where it is, but the Lord will help me to find it. And I found something that I had not seen before while studying these passages. In Acts 11, the Word of God reads, beginning with the first verse, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the Word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised, and didst eat with them. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning, and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa, praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, a certain vessel descend as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when, when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. Strange things fall out of heaven. Even four-footed beasts, wild beasts, and creeping things and fowls of the air. Now, if you've ever wondered if there's animals in heaven, you know your answer now. Because the sheet returned again. It is, that is, it returned from whence it came. I won't try to elaborate on that theologically. But I said, if you've ever wondered about animals in heaven, you know. Because this sheet came out of heaven. Strange things fall out of heaven. But only strange because we don't understand the nature of God. Strange because we become strange and foreign to the ways of heaven. Peter was a man of God. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. And yet his tradition, and his tradition was given of God, the Mosaic economy, was such that when God got ready to really bring the gospel to the Gentiles, he could not see, and it took a divine miracle. It took a divine revelation to change Paul on the road to Damascus. And it took strange things falling out of heaven for Peter to begin to see that you and I were included in the divine economy of God. The thing that's on my heart tonight is that for years and years and years, I've been able to see that our theology and our traditions and our upbringing oftentimes blocks us from the nature and the leading of Almighty God. And if we were to but listen and to look carefully, God would be able to show us, yes, it may seem strange, for strange things fall out of heaven. Strange because it clashes with our background. Strange because it clashes with our, with our theological opinions. Strange because we've been taught in so many wrong ways, in ways that hold us in rigid patterns. But not so strange after we've been taught the lessons that God wants us to learn. Notice he did it three times. 
Peter was a little hard-headed at this point. Once, twice, three times. Why didn't he just arise and kill the clean animals? Well, probably because of the mixture of both clean and unclean as described in the Mosaic law found in, in the Old Testament. Whatever reason, he did not do it. But that really wasn't God's purpose because the sheep and the animals were taken back up to heaven. But the message was with Paul because immediately at his door there were certain men who took him to Cornelius to Caesarea by the sea where the Holy Spirit fell. The upper room of Gentile Christianity came to pass. You and I will be there in a few days. Of course, I've mentioned to you in times past how that guide spoke to us, Shebtira, about we don't think enough of Caesarea by the sea. Well, I sure didn't because I hardly knew what he was talking about. But he said to you Gentiles, this is the upper room of Christianity. He was a Jew. And yet he knew that this should be of value to us. He knew his New Testament. Don't you realize that Jesus had already taught the disciples this very lesson? The very lesson that God was having to bring, Jesus had already said it. It's found in Mark 7. 14th verse. Now remember, Peter was listening to all of this, but he never got it. And when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. Now, now listen, folks. Jesus said, hearken unto me, every one of you. He wanted everybody to get it. But his, even his disciples didn't get it. Hearken unto me, every one, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. There's your answer right there. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus really wanted them to hear. He wanted Peter to hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he said unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. But Peter never got it. The disciples didn't get it. And consequently, there was great issue out of Jerusalem over circumcision and uncircumcision and over abstaining from certain foods which were not kosher. And yet Jesus... And this very word here did away with the necessity of kosher food. He did away with the ceremonial cleansing, with the necessity of the ceremonial cleansing of food. But they didn't hear him. They didn't see the progressive work of God. They didn't get the revelation of God. And yet Jesus spoke it and said, let everyone hear and even on the day of Pentecost, after they had been filled with the Holy Ghost, they never got it. Prejudice and tradition prevail. But God thought enough of us, of us as Gentiles to send creeping things and beasts and fowls on a sheet out of heaven down before Peter that he may get the message and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. Maybe... After that, he remembered what Jesus said. It is not what goes into a man that defiles him, but it's what comes out of a man. That's the reason, dear ones, that I can't say that a man can, will go to hell because he smokes or drinks or whatever. Because I know what Jesus said. 
See, there's times when we preach such a message. It could be that a man, if he just wants to be disobedient and that he's walking a path of disobedience and that is typical of his life, that could keep him out of heaven. But that in of itself will not keep a man out of heaven because that doesn't defile him. Really. It's what comes out of a man's heart. And so for years, evangelical Christianity has made as if our outward walk with God is what makes us righteous before God. And it hasn't been that at all. Granted, an outward walk reflects our inward walk. And certain things happen to us outwardly. Our speech changes. Sometimes our dress changes, if needs be. And other things change. But the real change is the change of the heart. And yet... After the heart has been changed, we're in services together and the Lord will speak something so preciously and we won't get it. A little burden on my heart tonight is the burden that I carry so often concerning the, the, the uh, gifts that God has given us, the talents, that which we're able to do. For years and years and years I've spoken, yet I can see that it's hard for us to hear. I've spoken that doesn't make any difference what God has given us. Until God brings us to the place that he wants us to be, our gifts aren't really worth much anyway. And I have decried, I have uh, um, somehow I've been disturbed with what I call, if I trust if there are any Youth for Christ people, remember I was a Youth for Christ director myself. So, um, and, and I'm for Youth for Christ. But what I thought was a Youth for Christ mentality, if we found out that a man could toot a horn, we would tell him, come and blow your horn for Jesus. Well, maybe he didn't need to blow his horn for Jesus. Maybe he should never blow his horn for Jesus. Maybe blowing his horn blew his ego. And whatever blows your ego or elevates your ego, you don't need to do it all. And all we do with Christianity is we take our self-assertive desires and cover them with the sweetness and the chocolateness of Christianity, but it's still just as evil underneath. But we're going to toot our horn regardless. And if we can't toot it over here, we'll toot it over there. We'll find a place to toot. Because brother... We know we got a gift and we're going to use it for God. Who says? Guy Young's coming here not to sing and play. He knows this. He's coming because Jesus is sending him. We're hoping and trusting that the Lord will use him because this lovely voice has been given. But it isn't necessarily so. I hope you won't have thoughts in your mind so it will allow him to sing if Jesus wants him. Because God could set him down for a year, year and a half till you decide to give up just to teach you a lesson. Once, Brother Helm, we had a waiting and uh, somebody came with thoughts and I said, well, Brother Helm's like all the rest. It'll just be his singer singing in this place. Well, that robbed the rest of us from a blessing because they didn't sing the whole meeting. Maybe we had one or two songs the last, the very last, after three days. But see, God heard that. So it stopped Roger, it stopped John, and it stopped, uh, anyway, John McAdams. It stopped the boys from singing. Oh, we just wanted to hear them sing. You know, we thought we might, but, uh, and we weren't pushing carnally, but it stopped everything because somebody had such a thought. Oh, you know something, dear ones? What, what Jesus has for us, if I could just get us to see, and I'm trying, just through this little illustration, I'm trying real hard to cause us to see that we've not neglected anybody when we've obeyed God. And God hasn't overlooked anybody. But friends, as long as there's that desire for you to perform or for you to entertain or get your gift used for God, then the truth of the matter is we're not being fair to you to let you up here. I'm not being good for you. I do it sometime to encourage. I do it sometime. God permits it sometime. But if God really had his way, 
He'd want to wipe that out of us till we'd realize that we aren't anything. See, I've said this before, but we haven't got it. Till we realize that, that, that we're not anything. And that if God never used us again, to be used of God once in a lifetime be worth a lifetime of living. I'm trying to get that message myself. To be used of God once in a lifetime is worth a lifetime of living. You know, I'm preaching a funny gospel. Strange things are falling out of heaven, folks. I know it. I can tell it. Yeah. Strange things are falling out of heaven. And Christianity didn't like it. And our carnal nature doesn't like it. But it's what we need. It's what God wants for us. Because really, for God, I'm telling you, it stirs me up to think a little girl in this place 10 years ago who <clears throat> didn't think she could sing at all and, had, and was to have five children eventually and doesn't want to sing to this very day. I, I, I marvel to, to think how God would cause her to influence. We, her tree the other night was almost 90 people. It's now almost 90 people that Jeannie's life is influenced. And yet, when we mention her life, the witness was on helplessness. A little child, she'll lead them. Didn't want anything, didn't want to sing, doesn't really care to today, except if God leads, she'll get up and then she's happy when God comes upon her and she's able to sing for Jesus and for his people. See, that's a marvelous way to be, folks. She told me once that when she travels and she goes into a place, she's so frightened, she'll say, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, please don't have me sing here. Oh, God, oh, Jesus, please, Lord, if you could just let me out of here. I know about that because I'm praying, oh, God, I hope I don't have to pray or preach in this place. Jesus, Jesus now I don't want to grieve you, but Lord, now, if you, now, why is that attitude? The attitude is because, well, we want to do what God wants us to do, but there's such a great need. There's such a great need and there's such a great knowledge of nothingness and it just, we just soon not let God do it. Do you realize it's that way? Only because of your love has preaching become an enjoyable thing for me here. I was called to preach at 15, began preaching at 15, and preach, I've now preached for more than 25 years, but I've only enjoyed it for five. Except for this place, Stephen knows, and the rest of these men know, that I have no desire to preach. And I don't have a carnal desire to preach here. It's because of the love of Jesus and the marvelous work of Jesus that I get some enjoyment out of preaching here. Why, why should I enjoy preaching and taking the risk of losing you? Well, you can't enjoy that. If I'm going to preach, I'm going to have to be faithful. And what I've just said right here, some, some people are already in struggle with. They think I'm after them personally. I'm, yeah, I am too. Come think of it. I, I, I'm after them for Christ. I'm after them to be all for God. You see, dear ones, there's many talented people in this place and God wants to fill it with talented people, but not that they can toot their horns. You've got fuddles on this platform. You've got men that are gifted in, in areas more than I am. They sit there and they pray for me. Their first assignment is to pray for me. It's funny how I can get, every, I can get people want to toot horns, but they won't want to pray. Pray. Oh, brother, they're ready to go with their gifts. But when it comes time for prayer, whoops. And it's the greatest thing we can do. And here's men gifted. Here's a man that gets on the fire that sounds like a Billy Sunday. Here's a man right here these mind surpasses most and he brings great jewels to us. Here's another man. Here's a lay preacher up here. When God gets him, it sounds like Abraham's coming through. Here's my daddy, preached for more than 40 years, who has gifts that none of us have. Here's Terry. Oh my goodness, just the, the gifts are just beginning to blossom. And here's David, the best trained man on the platform. Got the best degree, best train. They sit. Well, now, I tell you, I'm telling you what's going on around here. Seems to me that these associates ought to preach once in a while. Who says?
And yet that's going on in Christianity today. So it's trying to get a better job. So it's trying to get a place to preach. So it's trying to get their own church. So it's trying to get a better salary. So it's associates that want to toot their horn. Brother, if you want a horn to toot, get to Dick and let him teach you the trumpet. And when Sunday morning comes, get back up behind the thing and let her fly on the opening hymn and invite people. Give us a call to worship. You might save your soul behind that kind of horn. But the kind of horn I'm worried about is the horn of self-assertiveness and the horn of carnality and the horn that says, I've just got to do it. I'm being overlooked in this place. I must love someone an awful lot. And, 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 and you are the ones because my friends, you are a talented bunch of people and this congregation's growing. And what am I going to do with all of you? That's the reason years ago I said I would prefer, if I've got to be the main preacher around here and preach, I'd prefer to preach and have very few singers so, we, so I wouldn't have all this to wrestle with. And yet, God's given us the grace of singers. I mean, precious and beautiful voices. But you see, you see, dear ones, there's a greater work. There's a greater work for me. There's a greater work for these fellows than that talent that we may seem to be a little better than somebody else had. There's a greater work for us. The greater work is to find our nothingness and in our helplessness, then for God to call upon us. The truth of the matter is, while you're learning to be nothing, here's where God's going to call on you if you really listen to his voice. He's going to call on you to do what you cannot do so well. That's what you need to do. He's going to call on you to do, do that which you have to really depend upon him. But Lord, I'm able to, no, you're not to do that. You, you express your carnality in that area, your, your self-assertiveness. God wants you to do something that puts you on your knees day and night. And I've, I've preached this message for years, but we haven't got it. And so I hear the horns tooting. Want to toot for Jesus. Oh, dear ones. Oh, dear ones. Be nothing for Jesus. And lean upon him. Then when he calls you, when he calls you to do something, until those gifted areas are completely slain, he may never use them at all. May, may never use the loveliest of voices. Why aren't the people of the world in the kingdom of God with so great a gift? Because they cannot deny themselves. The world's going to bring more applause. The world's going to bring more reward if they really have good voices. And yet it's obvious to you and to me that those gifts have been given by Jesus Christ. And some of them would be used in the kingdom. Not all of them. Not all the gifted ones. You know why all of them wouldn't be used? Because they cannot keep their gifts and their Christianity. It's just in the nature of things. Maybe because the way that they were raised up. I don't know. So they come, you say, well, how can I be happy? Well, don't you know happiness is not uh, centered on the use of your gifts? I can tell what's going on in some minds and I don't have time to clear it up. But uh, maybe I can clear it up at a later day. I'm thinking of the, of the parable of the talents. <laughs> I've got an answer for you. I preached on that one too before. But I just have to leave that so that you might be able to get this point. See, folks, we're not really happy to be nothing in Jesus. If there wasn't a great, if there wasn't, if there wasn't quite a few this way, I couldn't preach this way. But I know that this is the temptation of many, many people. Oh, may God help us to hear. Jesus said, hear me. If you can hear, they didn't hear. And so the Lord had to let strange things fall out of heaven so that Peter may get the message. We don't really know the value or the tremendous revelation that Peter got because we don't know, we don't know that uh, the Jewish feeling, the Jewish way of life, the tremendous Jews that these men were and for God to wipe that out. See, they wanted to kill Jesus again and again and again because he was trying to bring the essence of life to them to do away with the types and the shadows and to bring with that which really gave meaning and that which really gave life. Well, it's just a little lesson, folks. It's just a little thing. But it's important. 
Sometimes it may seem strange what's happening. And God may repeat his strangeness, but if you'll listen, the, the lesson that he's trying to teach you is the opportunity that's coming next around the corner. And it may mean great revival for a precious people who are hungry for God because you're willing to deny yourself, throw out your, no longer, your traditions that are no longer valid and to do God's will because God never witnesses on anything that's wrong. Strange it may seem, but right it is. It's a little lesson. But I think if you'll take it and dwell on it, it'll do us some good here and in the future. I love you with all my heart, but you break my heart. And that's supposed to be that way. You know, but oh, I don't want you to get fixated. See, all of you talented ones, and that is a great number of you here. I mean, obvious, your talents are sticking out. What are you going to do, dear ones, if, if, if the way you feel about your talent and its use, if that's universal for happiness, what are you going to do for all the precious people who don't have what you have? Aren't you glad that God's given us what's universal? And that's nothingness. That's universal. Oh, I'm getting happy now. See, what, what's good for everybody, have, see, what's really valid in terms of reality has to be universal. And if you've got to get your talents on display, then what are you going to do with people that doesn't have the obvious talents? Something's wrong with your theology. And that means you're nourishing something that's not good for you because it's not universal. But if you want to nourish anything, nourish your nothingness. That's universal. Then let God have his way and let him lead. I know this message sounds strange, but it's not as strange as what is the way that Peter felt when the sheep came down. That was by far stranger. In the days ahead, when you hear me preach, please don't think I'm trying to hurt you or I'm trying to do this. No, it may seem strange for a moment, but it'll help us by and by. I love you. And Jesus loves you more than I do. And when he brings these things to us, it can make quite a difference. See, some talents may lie dormant or be put aside until the Holy Ghost awakening. You know this man right here? Kenneth, come up here. Bless God you're here. Here's one of the most talented men. He has gifts that I don't have. Right here. I want you to look at him. He was helping me tonight. I said, he's still my associate pastor, the God and the Holy Spirit witness back there. Did, <laughs> did you know that he... he He's been working in the factory how long? Seven and a half years. Seven and a half years. Why isn't he preaching the gospel? Because Jesus, he does preach the gospel because he goes when God calls and when God speaks. Though, but the great time of God using him has not yet arrived. How in the world can he be so happy? <laughs> How, can, how he, can he be so happy to install windows and, and fix a furnace and fix cars and help, help Brother Helm? How can you be so happy? Because, uh, and we had a message not too long ago, Brother, I wish I'd have had you here with us. Because you found that pouring water on the hands of Elijah is the work of an Elisha. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> He's been doing it, been doing it. In the factory now, he's been working seven and a half years. It may be seven and a half years longer. See, Christendom won't have this. Nominal Christendom won't have And you won't have it either unless you're dead, dead, dead. Right. Crucified with Christ. But I'm telling you, God's looking for men that he can trust. And if he wants to hold you in a factory for 20 years, he's holding you there for a purpose. First place, he's holding for you for your good and somebody else's good. And then for the ultimate good. For the ultimate work of God that's to come in your life. Right. With me, Kenneth, he took me out in a hurry. I didn't want to go. And he said, get out. It was important for me to get out as it was for you to get in a factory. Right. Because your life taught me a lot of things. I couldn't understand how you and Barry could do it. You just pull up and move. Just leave everything and move. Just pull up and move. Go to Fisher. Go to Parker. Go wherever Jesus said. Come out to be with me. Wherever Jesus said. I, I thought, my, my. How can this be? <laughs> never a thought. Never a ripple. Just joy and happiness. Amen. Maybe you saw a sheet some years ago and strange things fell out of heaven. But they're not strange any longer because yes, you got the message.
Amen. Quite a message Kenneth I've given here tonight. Thank God's grace. I, I'm Beautiful. realizing it's it wonderful. the further we go and now that I think about your wonderful life, the more I realize how strange it really is. Money? What's the matter with you? Don't you know anything don't you know anything better than to clean my car on Saturday night? Don't you know you're a servant of the most high God? Oh, isn't that rather strange? Now, if you think I'm pulling from my car clean, you got another thing coming. You're not getting my lesson. Well, but whenever he comes, the Holy Spirit really witnesses when he comes and cleans my car right. on Saturday night. He and Sandy was out there cleaning the brown car and the blue car. And oh, what a joy it was to take guy yes. young out there. Doesn't he? Yeah, he, you know what? He's got just sense enough to know better. He's got sense enough some way. There's some wonderful work with God and with him that'll get him to the very place that everybody else wants to go, but they're not going to make it because they want to be on display. This man right here. Have you thought, dear ones, thank you, Kenneth. Have you thought, dear ones, how great this man is or have you overlooked him? The fellows up here have not overlooked him. Stephen likes to be with him about 24 hours a day. Have you thought how great this man is? Uh, uh, don't you try to check with Raymond and with Monty? Whenever God won't, some way won't tell us, then you'll get out here and check with these men as to where God's leading. What greater gift in the world than the gift of discernment, the inner witness of the Holy Spirit to tell you what to do? And these laymen have that gift right here. One works on automobiles, the other one works in a factory and comes and cleans a preacher's car on Saturday night and does it with joy and has done it for a long, long time. Folks, I'm just using these men as examples because you're looking at great men. You're looking at men and their front row sitters. Great men. I won't push it home any further. I'll say, folks, I feel kind of strange myself, but I didn't fall out of heaven. I was born here on earth. I'm hoping to go there. It'll be all right for me sometime when I get in a place like this. Lord, just lift up the sheet and get me out of here. You know something? I know what I'm talking about. I'm trying to help you real good. Because I know when that heart is utterly slain that God can do with you maybe not what you thought, but what is really good for the kingdom of God and good for you and good for me and good for everybody else. It's a joy to see. There's a little lady over here, the wife of Kenneth Bright. We didn't, how long have you been saved, Beverly? Seven years. That's a good number to be saved. Nobody knew when she first started walking in the kingdom that she would be one of the bright jewels of this congregation. She doesn't profess to be anything. She's not trying to be anything. She sings in the choir. She's not trying to manifest herself. She's not trying to make herself known. She hasn't even told us about the gifts, nor has her husband very much told us about her gifts. But I'm telling you folks, when God speaks through her, this place shakes. And I said to the fellows today, I don't know if Kenny or Beverly are going on a trip. I told Stephen to call them. I think one of them are going. But I knew that if Jesus took either one of them, it'd be a blessing on this trip. See, one highly esteemed, and we found her because we found her in nothingness, found her in waiting, found her trusting, found her looking to Jesus. It's a great experience. Wednesday night, it would be my joy if my responsibility changed. I'd like to preach on grace or love or preach on something. And yet, I've had a wonderful time today. What seems strange is not so strange at all. But the door to Holy Ghost revival. Stephen, what seems so strange is not strange at all, but the door to Holy Ghost revival. I better close with that. I can't top it. No. Let's stand.